Okay, let's pray, everyone. Father God, thank you that we can be together and uh, we open our hearts to you, Lord. We open our minds, our spirits, our souls, and ask for your Holy Spirit to guide us and illuminate your word to us and print something afresh to us. And uh, Lord, we, we want to love you with all of our heart, our soul, our strength, and our mind, Lord. And to love our neighbor as ourselves. Amen. 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 Well, I'm ready for Purim. I've got my wine here. Ooh. Because you know, they say <laughs> this is the one day of the year that uh, the Jews should get drunk. And uh, I'm not going to get drunk. But the reason why is really interesting because the story of Purim uh, is basically where we were totally out of control. Haman, uh, yeah, that man Haman, and uh, he convinced Ahasuerus to, to um, spin, they spun the poor from where we get the word Purim, which means a lot, and it fell on a day, and on that day, every single Jew in 127 provinces was going to get killed. So we Jews, we were just totally, the situation was just it was a nightmare it was dark it was bleak to say the least in other words we were totally out of control of our destiny and that's why we get drunk mm -hmm. because we are out of control and it's to remind us that when we are out of control there is an unseen god who is in control Mm. And that's the one of the key themes of the book of Esther is the unseen God. He's not even mentioned in the book of Esther. And the name Esther is from the Hebrew word Musa, which means hidden. That's mm. what the word Esther means, hidden. And that's what she was told to do. She was told to hide her identity yes. from her uh, uncle Mordecai. Yay. Yay! And uh, and so she lived a, a hidden life. She was the queen, and um, and that's why, of course, we dress up in costumes to hide our identity. And uh, and the, that theme comes through in the New Covenant. Paul talks about us living a, a hidden lives. Our lives are hid in the Messiah, in Christ Jesus, and. Um, once our lives are hidden, basically, it means they're dead. And then the glory of the Lord, the light can shine. The, the unseen God can come through in ways. And uh, I pray and hope if anyone's here listening through the recording or whatever, that if you need uh, a miracle, uh, that it would happen, uh, especially at this joyful time of the year, Pauline. Amen. Well, we're carrying on our studies <clears throat> of uh, Exodus, and we are up to Exodus uh, uh, 19. No, we're up to Exodus 28. 27. Yeah, uh, Exodus 27. 27. 27. Yes, yeah, sorry. I, I, I spilled some water on my printer while I was printing them out, so I've got, it's all blurred here. But in any, any event, <clears throat> what we've come to, through everyone we've come through the story of the israelites coming out of egypt and then uh, coming to mount sinai not only receiving the law but receiving the pattern for the tabernacle the house of god and we talked about that over the last couple of weeks that god he's basically wanting us to build him a house and by the way who's the house for is it for him or is it for us and I think it's for both. It is his house, but he is inviting us to come in to that house. And we'll, we'll really get deep into this as we go into the book of uh, Leviticus later on. But it's, all, it's an invitation to come into his house and to have communion with him. So today we're, we're kind of leaving all the statutes, the commands, the, the, uh, the ordinances that we looked at. And now it's kind of an introduction 
to Aaron and his sons, the priesthood, this whole um, theme of priesthood. And it's been in the scriptures before. Uh, Abraham was a priest. Moses was a priest. Melchizedek was a priest. But this is really focusing on it on a national scale here. And um, it starts off in uh, our first uh, verse of Exodus 27, 20. It says, and you shall command the children of Israel that they bring you pure oil of pressed olives for the light to cause the lamp to burn continually. So the word, and you shall command, is the name of our uh, parasha. Titzavet, you shall command. They were commanded. In other words, Moses is being told to command the children of Israel that every day they are to go and get pressed olives for the light in the holy place. And that light was the menorah. Okay. Now, this was not a side, if you feel like it, or just a, a little side issue. This was very, very important. And it's important for us too. And I'll bring that out in just a second. Why did the, con and by the way, this is really the beginning of congregational duties. Why did they, why was this so important? Why did they, firstly, why did they need light? Well, think about it. You've got the tabernacle with the outer light. You've got the tabernacle with the menorah light. And then you've got the tabernacle with the Shekinah glory light, the light of God himself, which is a supernatural, mysterious light that none of us can really fully understand, like on the Mount of Transfiguration. They, they saw the Lord. He illuminated. Um, and... Uh, Moses's face glowed because he'd been in the presence of the Lord. But number one, when the Israelites came into the tabernacle and they saw the menorah, everyone, they would, number one, perhaps be reminded that God is light. He is the source of all light, bringing us back to the creation story. Out of the darkness, God spoke and said, let there be light. So he's the source of all light. And he is light. Actually, it says in 1 John, God is light and in him is no darkness. Number two, as they were in that tabernacle and they saw that menorah, it would have reminded them of their call. What was Israel's call, everyone? It was to be a menorah. It was their call to be a light to the nations. Not darkness, but light. And number three, um, I think for practical reasons, when they went into that tabernacle, it practically gave them light so that they could function in the tabernacle. The priests could do the work. They could carry out their other duties as well. As well. And um, so it probably in every one of those categories that I just mentioned, it probably had different layers of depths to it. Um, but think about it in our lives today. Think about when you see a menorah. It should remind us, number one, that God is light. He's the source of all light. Number two, our call is to be light, the salt and the light. And we follow someone who said, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of life. He gives us the light of life. He is the spirit. It says in Second. Corinthians, now the Lord is the spirit. And where the spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. So that spirit is like the crushed oil, everyone. Because you needed the oil in that seven branch 
candelabrum called the menorah. You needed to go and get the oil and you needed to crush. So it took the Israelites work. And that's the, the message here, everyone, to the Israelites. Moses is commanding the Israelites, you shall command. But the children of Israel, that they bring you pure oil of pressed olives for the light to cause the lamp to burn continually. When you and I are going through a different, difficult time, what do we do? Where to cr- get the oil, where to crush the oil, where to put it in the menorah, where to get light. When you and I are in darkness, where to, where to not to look for the darkness, where to, where to go to the light. And one of the ways we do that is actually go to God's word, which is a lamp to our feet and a light to our path. And the more light and the more we go to the light, the more it will equip us and empower us to do the work that the Lord has called us to. And I think ultimately, whether we call ourselves it or not, we are all priests. We are called to be priests to the Lord. Originally, the Israelites, they were all called to be a holy nation, a royal priesthood. They, all, they didn't step up. That was the problem. Only the Levites stood up. We got to stand up. This is a high calling. And it's something, I'm, it's not a pressure thing, everyone. God, he will bring us to that place. And it's a, it's a, it's a, a thing that we go through in stages and depths, I believe. But I believe that this is our high calling, the priesthood, where we intercede, where we mediate, where we are, if I can use the word vicar, this is where we get the word vicar from, the word vicarious, which means on behalf of. And we talked about this a few weeks ago with Yitro, Jethro, remember? When Moses came out and told Jethro everything that he had done, Jethro rejoiced. He was the first man in the Bible that rejoiced, not for something that happened to him, but something that happened for other people. And he basically instructed or counseled Moses to set up people to help him in the ministry so that he could deal with the more important issues, delegation. So this priesthood that the Israelites were called to, but the first thing that's mentioned is light everyone. And whatever it takes us, whatever that crushed olive is symbolic of in our lives, and that, that can be open to many different interpretations. But usually the olives and the oil are symbolic of the spirit, the crushed, condensed spirit. And it's interesting, if you look at the four Gospels, we see the work of the Lord in a physical body on earth. But the Gospels end with him ascending to the heavens. And then the book of Acts begins with his spirit coming, working through his body. So, and that's where we we get that verse in 2 Corinthians. Now, the Lord is the spirit. And we need to understand that he is with us in spirit. And we need that spirit. And but, But it sometimes takes work. And I'm not talking about works for our salvation. I'm talking work against our flesh fighting against our flesh, fighting against the world, fighting against the evil, fighting against the darkness, fighting against all opposition, against the tide. You know what I'm talking about. And we have to fight for the light. We have to, uh, you know, I've said this before. In the Bible, the day begins at nighttime. So in other words, the first thing 
the beginning of the day is facing the darkness because it begins in the evening according to the scriptures it says there was evening and there was morning usually when you and i go to bed at night we think the day's over but actually that's when it begins and when we begin the day whether it's at night time or when we first wake up in the morning we're to face the darkness in ourselves in the world the things that we are facing we face the darkness and we instantly go for the light we don't focus on the darkness we go straight to the light because the light is greater than the darkness we can't fight the darkness we can only turn on the supply of light and that's the lord and get connected to the lord so this is part of what i believe it means to be a priest and by the way in the book of revelation the churches the seven churches that are mentioned the symbol of those churches everyone is the menorah john uses that torah symbol in the tabernacle and then later on in the temple as a symbol of the church so let's identify as a menorah as a lampstand that's who we are and we're to let our light shine but we got to get that oil we got to get those wicks trimmed daily we got to get that crushed oil that means it needs pressing it needs crushing whatever that means we need to ask the lord to show us what that means we can talk a lot about that in isaiah chapter 11 verse 1 it says there shall come forth a rod out of jesse and a branch shall grow out of the, his roots this is talking about the mashiach and by the way do you know what the word mashiach means or christ the, the greek is christ but the hebrew is mashiach it literally means anointed one and the spirit of the lord shall rest on him the spirit of wisdom the spirit of understanding the spirit of counsel and might the spirit of the knowledge and of the fear of the lord this is where we grow in wisdom in understanding in counsel in might in knowledge and in the fear of the lord as we spend time pressing into the lord maybe that's what it means to be pressed to be crushed where we press against almost like a a picture of uh of someone pressing weights you might like this one trend someone pressing weights when you're pressing it's hard you're feeling like you're being crushed you everything against your 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 even sweat comes out maybe that's a good picture of what it means to press into the lord against our flesh against our uh struggles and even against our mind everyone sometimes it doesn't seem natural it doesn't seem logical pressing in in the situations that we're in it doesn't seem logical um and that's what the fear of the lord is it's trusting god when it's not logical but we got to keep pressing in and it's a crushing it's hard because it in a way it offends our logic it offends our ego it offends our uh, rationale in fact uh you know people talk about in corinthians when paul talks about praying with our uh we we pray with our spirit and with our understanding and then he goes into talking in tongues and all of that and he 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 talks about the difference between pr- that that the spirit prays on our behalf because we don't know what we we uh we need to intercede for but the spirit does he knows now in chapter 27 of exodus verse 21 at the bottom of page 1 in the tabernacle of meeting outside the veil which is before the testimony 
Aaron and his sons shall tend it from evening until morning before the Lord. It shall be a statute forever to their generations on behalf of the children of Israel. This is not just a, a, a little verse that accidentally got into the Bible, everyone. It didn't just, uh, you know, jump in there by mistake. This is a very strong ordinance from evening until morning. Okay, this is a, um, I'm going to read that again. In the tabernacle of meeting outside the veil, which is before the testimony, Aaron and his son shall tend it from evening until morning. Notice it doesn't say from morning till evening. It says from evening till morning. This is an all night thing. Oh my gosh. Why did I put this verse in our notes? It shall be a statute forever to their generations on behalf of the children of Israel. This is a real challenge for those. I'm going to add anything more to it. Now, at the top of page two, we now come to the priest's clothes. And this is really what I want to focus on in today's study. The priest's clothes and um i have entitled our study today <clears throat> uh, garments of righteousness of beauty and of glory because that's what it says look what it says in exodus 28 verse 2 and you shall make holy ga garments for aaron your brother for splendor or honor or dignity and for beauty in Hebrew, Vasita Begde Kodesh, Le Aharon Achicha, Le Kavod, Ule Tiferet. Okay, the, the garments are for beauty, dignity, splendor, and for beauty and honor. The beauty and the honor, everyone, should be to them symbolic of what? What are they for beauty and what are they for uh, glory or honor for? Was it for themselves? So that when they walked out in front of everyone, they looked great? Was it so that they could raise their chins up and their noses? Or was it for the Lord? Was it so that they could dress nice for the Lord? Like the Jewish people, when they dress up, in their best clothes for Shabbat. You know that that's why they dress up in their best clothes for Shabbat, everyone, is because they want to look their best for the Lord on Shabbat. Because it's like that mar marriage ceremony. Remember, we talked about that at Mount Sinai when they received the law. And one of the first commands was about the Shabbat. And it was there at Mount Sinai that they were it was like a, a betrothal, a marriage ceremony where they were at the canopy at the foot of the mountain and Moses was up and he had the veil over his face and uh, they exchanged the vows where he said, you keep all the commands and they said, everything you said, we will do. And they had the dowry that they brought out of Egypt and um uh so all these symbols of a marriage and that's why the jewish people dress so nice for the lord so yeah why are they for, for what are they for beauty and for splendor or glory or honor these garments uh, i believe again this is open for interpretation but i know some of the ancient sages would say it's twofold number one it's for the lord it's to to uh, honor the lord but also number two it's to honor the priesthood it is to express something deep about the actual priesthood the whole picture of the priesthood what is the picture of the priesthood everyone it's where aaron the, remember, there's the great high priest, Aaron, and then there is the other priesthood, which dealt with other duties, such as butchering the animals 
cleaning up the blood, the instruments, the music, and a whole lot of things well, we're not going to go into today. But the, the heart of the priesthood is ushering in people into the presence of the Lord and interceding, being vicarious on behalf of the people. This is represented by the breastplate that Aaron had with the 12 stones and the Urim and the Thummim, these electrical lights that shone by the presence of the Lord that glowed in a certain way that gave uh, Aaron or whoever the high priest was direction, discernment, and wisdom. So this was, th these garments, everyone, these garments, when you put them on, now there was about, uh, about 24 different garments that the high priest had, and there was about a half of that number that the regular priests wore. So the high priest had a much splendid, much more higher calling. We, we know that. That's obvious. But uh, all of the priesthood, they put their clothes on every, every morning, and they went out to, to fulfill their roles. Those garments took with it not only an authority, but a, a humility that came with it. A humility because of the seriousness of that job, the sacredness of it. Notice it says in Exodus 28 too, and you shall make holy garments for Aaron, your brother. Big day Kodesh is the Hebrew word from the word Kadosh, holy. So you didn't just go to your closet, throw on whatever you want and go out. No, you are. And, and you know, we, we laugh about it. But when you think about some of the different Christian denominations that wear robes and scarves, you know, maybe we should, instead of mocking or laughing at them, maybe we should take some of those garments quite serious. Because maybe there is something very sacred about these garments that maybe they need to be instituted into our churches. I don't know. I'm, I don't want to uh, uh, suggest we do that. I'm just saying, when you look at it in its context, I think there's something sacred, something very reverend, and something holy about these garments. You know, we have an example in the scriptures of someone who did the exact opposite of what should have been done. Remember the story of Nadav and Abihu, the sons of Aaron, the very sons of Aaron, the sins of them, when they offered up what was called strange fire. It says, Vayikrivu lifnei Adonai esh Zara, Ashelotiva Otam, which says, Now, a, a, Nadav and Abihu, the sons of Aaron, they took their fire pans and, after putting fire in them, placed incense on it and offered strange fire before the Lord, which he had not commanded them. And fire came out from the presence of the Lord and consumed them, and they died before the Lord. Then Moses and Aaron, I'm sorry, then Moses said to Aaron, it is what the Lord spoke saying, by those who come near me, will I be treated as holy? And before all the people, I will be honored. So this was a strange fire that the Lord had not commanded. So there is such a thing, everyone, as you and I putting on our clerical robes or standing up in the name of the Lord and doing things that the Lord has not commanded or doing it in an irreverent way. Moses himself did something very irreverent when the Lord told him, speak to the rock. I want to bring water out to my thirsty people. And Moses took upon himself 
something that wasn't him his to do, his place to do, and he struck the rock. And and the Lord said, because you did not glorify me in the eyes of Israel. So uh, this unholy priesthood we see in the example of Aaron's own sons and the fire from the Lord came out and consumed him. Wow. You know, what a, what a challenge to Aaron. Now, Aaron, he knew what it was like to, to make a, 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 a bad era of judgment at Mount Sinai when he was persuaded by the Israelites to uh, build a golden calf. So he'd already, uh, in a way, had one uh, blemish to his name. And uh, in a way, uh you know this was a was a i don't know if it was a wake up call or whether this put the fear of god into aaron but certainly um aaron you know he he would have if if he didn't witness it he would have heard about it his own sons the sons of the great high priest probably the whole community heard about this so um Now we get to the bottom of page two. It says in at, actually at the top of page three, Exodus 28, three, and you shall speak unto all that are wise hearted, whom I have filled with the spirit of wisdom, that they make Aaron's garments to sanctify him, that he may minister unto me in the priest's office now notice that it wasn't aaron who made the garments this was to be a community thing i'll read it again you shall speak unto all the wise hearted whom i have filled with the spirit of wisdom that they make aaron's garments to sanctify him the bear El kol lev to all the wise hearted. So this was to be a community thing here. And what does that say to us, everyone? As you and I are called to be priests, it means that we need wise hearted, spirit filled people around us to help equip us to help build us up, to help edify us so that we can come more and more into the fullness of this calling to be a priest or to be an evangelist or to be a pastor or to be a teacher or a whatever your call is. We all need people. And as people, are equipping and helping and instructing us in our calling. It's as if they are building garments for us of beauty and of honor and of splendor. And I hope everyone, I hope you and I can wear these garments with dignity and honor and not with shame. Because we all have a sense of, well, I'm not worthy. I'm not worthy. And I'm going to get to that in a minute. I'm going to deal with shame. We're going to touch on that today. But right now, I'm focusing on the command. And you are to command that they build garments. All the wise hearted. This is a command. Guys, you and I, we don't have a choice here. Because the thing is this. If we're not building ourselves up, in these garments and if we're not getting the light every day and getting those wicks trimmed and getting that oil then we're going backwards we're going to continue to be in darkness and what garments are we going to be wearing every day we're going to be wearing dirty garments we're going to be wearing filthy garments or we're going to be wearing some kind of fig leaf 
fig leaf to cover our nakedness, our shame. So every day, this is a command. This is a challenge to get these garments on and first to strip off. And again, I believe the more we go for the light, that the, 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 it's like these garments, they'll just naturally get stripped off. We don't have to waste our time looking at the darkness. It's like when you, if you arrive at home late at night and there's no light on inside, you open the door, it's dark. What do you do? You just turn the light on and the darkness is gone. That's all you have to do. Just go for the light. That's my philosophy. I've wasted too many years looking at the darkness, focusing on the darkness. And I've had to rechange my, my focus. We keep looking at the light. He's the one who said, if you follow me, the light of light, you will not walk in darkness, but you shall have the light of light. He, all he said is, if you follow me, keep looking for the light. Now, so, so once again, even though Aaron's call was an individual call to be the high priest, and even though the Levites had an individual call to be Levites, priests, they still were dependent on other people, the wise people, the spirit people to make the garments. Okay? So when people come to you with a word, with a prayer, with encouragement, don't push them away. Embrace them. Test all things by no means. Don't just take on anything and everything because sometimes people will put try to put garments on you that won't fit you or they're not for you they're they're out of place but certainly be open and don't be afraid and test all things and if if it fits then wear it put it on now in exodus 28 verse 29 it says so Aaron shall bear the names of the sons of Israel on the breastplate of judgment over his heart. I want to say that again. So Aaron shall bear the names of the sons of Israel on the breastplate of judgment over his heart. When he goes into the holy place as a memorial before the Lord continually. And you shall put in the breastplate of judgment the Urim and the Thummim, and they shall be over Aaron's heart when he goes in before the Lord. So Aaron shall bear the judgment of the children of Israel over his heart before the Lord continually. Gosh, can you see the glory, the beauty, the burden of Aaron wearing this? Guys, are you getting a taste of what it means to be a priest? Two times it mentions he's to wear the breastplate and it mentions the word over his heart. This is the real heart of the matter here because, guys, this is pointing because we don't have Aaron today. We have Yeshua. He is our great high priest. He is bearing every one of us on his breast, on his heart, over his heart. Think about that. Meditate on that, that this is not just a head knowledge that he bears us. He bears us right down into his loins, in his kidneys, over his heart. And what is the purpose of it all, everyone? It's to usher us into the Father's presence to usher us into the tabernacle, into the house of God. And remember what we said last week, the difference between the tabernacle and the Garden of Eden was that in the Garden of Eden, after the fall, there was a flaming sword to guard man from the tree of life. But in the tabernacle, 
There was no flaming sword. There was the mercy seat. And there was the cherubim over the mercy seat. These angelic beings ushering us into the presence of the Lord, which is the tree of life, everyone. It's to take us back to Eden. And what was Adam and Eve like in the Garden of Eden? They were clothed. Guess what they were clothed with? They were clothed with nakedness. They were clothed with nothing. And yet that was their holiness. That was their innocence. That was their purity. They had nothing. And that's where you and I need to be. No shame. No guilt. No condemnation. This happens when we know what the blood and the sacrifices are all about. And we're not going to go there today. But I'm sure those of us who are here and those that are watching. And if you don't know that that's what the blood of the sacrifice animal is all about. To atone for our sins. Our sins are washed in the blood. And it becomes a covering for us. It's a supernatural atonement. The word kapara from the word kippur, yom kippur. Once that blood is shed and those cherubim see that blood and it gets burned up and the smoke goes up and that smell comes up, it's accepted before the Lord. And we are atoned for. We become at one with God, from where we get the word atonement, at one moment with the Lord. And we then get a robe called the robe of righteousness. A robe of righteousness. See, th this robe is like the garments of Aaron for beauty and for honor and for glory see without these garments every day everyone we are going to have other garments we're going to make these garments they're called fig leaves and you and i will constantly build these fig leaves especially when we've got deep areas of shame and guilt that haven't been washed in the blood. And by the way, we will go through the rest of our lives dealing with these issues at different levels, different layers, different memories from our past that sometimes we haven't thought about for decades. One day we'll be walking down the road and a memory will come back. And all of a sudden it's like, wow, I haven't thought of that for a long time. And that's where we have to bring it. Like we're bringing it for someone else. Sometimes it's easier doing it for someone else. We also have to know how to do it for ourselves. And we have to deal with the shame and this guilt. And, you know, and I want to deal with this topic a little bit right now as we kind of come towards the, 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 the end. Shame, everyone, is so embedded in our, not only in our lives from the Garden of Eden, from our ancestors going back to Adam, but it is so much in our culture, the shame and honor culture that we live in. You know, a definition of shame, it is an unpleasant, self-conscious emotion typically associated with a negative evaluation of ourselves. Withdrawal motivations and feelings of distress, exposure, mistrust, powerlessness, and worthlessness. Shame can come in so many ways. For example, we make mistakes. People laugh at us. Remember that time at school when you 
when kids laughed at you and it shamed you or you did it to someone else to put them down or when we sin the effects of sin is guilt and shame or being sinned against some of us may be have been sinned against and it has caused damage and shame maybe someone has lied given a false report about you or maybe someone has abused you sexually and it has caused a deep shame and guilt what about the way we look sometimes that can be a huge thing point of shame in our culture where we don't measure up to what culture considers someone beauty and honor see these garments for Aaron they were for beauty and for dignity and honor in our culture today there are things that are spoken out there that this is dignity this is honor you look this certain way you act that certain way this is what's dignity and if you don't live up to it you feel ashamed too short too fat too thin what about an ethnic or religious background if you live in a culture if you live in a country i grew up in new zealand i uh, the 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 jewish community was only about 3000 people on average as i grew up so i was always on the outside i i always felt ashamed to be a jew i didn't want to be singled out as someone different so i tried to hide that i didn't did to be truly i was ashamed that i was a jew i you know people would make cutting remarks about jews so i didn't want to be the brunt of of jokes or put down so i tried to hide that fact uh sometimes you can you can live in in a in a culture where uh certain things don't suit in that culture for example i know people um who have german background and uh, it's not such a problem in this generation but going back a generation uh they had a sense of shame and that because of what uh, the the nazis did to not just the jews but to a lot of people in the second world war what about parents and children what about sometimes when children do things and uh it it brings a sense of shame uh you know to to the parents someone murders someone and they get in prison and it's big news and the parents they they had nothing to do with it and it brings a sense of shame or what about the other way around where the parents uh do things um and you know the rest of the family find out that you know remember this what's the story going on in America um this guy from Car- North Carolina or South Carolina he's just been in prison for two life uh for murdering his wife and one of his uh sons and what about a social status you know sometimes being even being a believer being a christian sometimes that in itself can we have to fight off feelings of shame or embarrassment because of other christians what they have done in the name of christ or what they've done in the name of christianity being made redundant i spoke to a uh, when i was in africa once there was a pastor he said 90% of his congregation were unemployed men they couldn't get work and the shame that they felt in their culture and in their very homes because they wanted to be the 
the, the, the man of the home. They wanted to be the breadwinner. They wanted to be the hunter and they couldn't. Or what about divorcees in our culture? The sense of shame, single parent family. There's so many areas uh, and we could go on and on and on talking and about shame and here's here's a, a, an area also what about confessing things in the church church in other words showing weakness in the church you know there are some churches they don't like to show their dirty laundry i'm not saying we should let it all out there but there are some leaders, there are some, they, they don't like showing that. They, they like showing that everything is fine, that they've got a strong faith, and that they've got everything together, and that you just believe in Jesus and everything is going fine, and I never have a bad day, okay? And, and it, it, in a way, that itself can be a fig leaf. So our culture, is covered with this shame and honor and some common symptoms of shame everyone some common symptoms is that people isolate they want to disappear most often shame causes people to want to bury their heads anything to pull out of connection with another person if you've ever wanted to avoid returning a phone call back out of a date or call in sick for a job interview, you probably were feeling some amount of shame. Or what about anger? Do you know anger is a common way people react to shame? It's a, it's a fig leaf. Often it's easier to blame someone else than to think maybe I've done something wrong. And the anger helps mitigate your own feelings of shame and guilt. For example, when a parent yells at a teenager and the teenager runs to his room and slams the door, the teenager's anger is really covering up his own feelings of shame. Not saying that the parent should yell. He shouldn't yell. And then there's self-blame. Shame can also cause people to heap blame onto themselves. When a te for example, when a teacher corrects you or gives you criticism, you may think, oh, I'm such an idiot. Why did I even take this class? I should quit. It's because you're feeling shame. You know, many people get into addictions. And often this is just a way of burying the pain, burying the shame, to give temporary relief, whether it's food or drugs or sex or alcohol or whatever escape it may be from those negative feelings. And what happens, it, it gets worse because those substances, when they get in the way of your life, you may feel even more shame for using them, causing a vicious cycle. So this is kind of what we call overcompensating in something, trying to prove a point, trying to build self-esteem by striving, the stress of failure. These are all fig leaves covering up our shame and our guilt. But guys, the, the heart of this message today is that God has given Aaron garments of beauty, garments of glory, garments of dignity. And he has commanded him. He's commanded the priest every day to get light, to get oil, to put on the garments every day. For beauty and for honor, not just for the Lord, for Aaron and the sons themselves. When they put on these garments, 
they know, notice the word, they are holy garments. They are not just common garments. They are holy garments. And guys, I hope you're getting what I'm trying to put forward today. When we receive these garments, these priestly garments, these garments of righteousness, they are number one, they are holy garments. Number two, they are beauty and for honor and for dignity. They are to cover our sin and not, not cover our sin and our shame, but they are to wash, cleanse, and do away. See, the thing is, before a priest got clothed with the garments, he had to be stripped in front of all the congregation. He had to be stripped. Then he had to be washed. Then he had to be anointed. And then he had to be clothed. Okay? So it's not just putting on these garments as a covering. It's first he had to be stripped, washed, anointed, and then clothed. And friends, I want to end by saying, in Jesus' day, in the days of Yeshua, there was no difference. He dealt with shame and honor. His disciples, they would always argue. Who is going to be the greatest? That was honor in those days. The religious people. Remember, they prayed and fasted and tithed to be seen by all men. They wanted dignity and honor in the eyes of man. And the Pharisees. The, the story of the woman caught in adultery. And they they were they were great moralists, weren't they? They you know they said she should be stoned. And I love what the Lord said. Okay, fine, all right. Whoever is without sin, let him cast the first stone. Great moralists we have. Do you know moralists, everyone? They're very good at throwing out God's word. hierarchical system versus the commoner the ones that wanted to sit in the seat of moses see all of this is wanting honor and the lord dealt with this when he said whoever wants to be the greatest must become the servant notice how the lord is turning it around whoever wants to be the greatest let him become the least he's turning it around When he said, I was hungry, I was naked, I was in prison. And they said, Lord, when? And by the way, in that culture, and like our culture, if you're hungry, if you're naked, and if you're in prison, they were very shameful places to be in culture, right? Naked, you don't have enough, you don't have clothes to wear, or you've got shabby clothes. Or you're hungry. You don't have bread to put on the table for your family. Or you're in prison. These are very shameful elements in our society. And the Lord actually said, when you visited me, uh, sorry, when you visited one of the least, you were honoring me. When you gave someone something to eat, you were honoring me. You were giving, it was as if you were giving me to eat. When you clothe someone, it was as if you were clothing me. He is turning things around. The heart of the Father, everyone, is to restore us. Jeremiah 23, there's a messianic prophecy from, from page six. And notice he starts out with the false shepherds here. Woe be unto the pastors, the shepherds that destroy and scatter the sheep of my pasture, says the Lord. 
Therefore, thus says the Lord God of Israel against the pastors that feed my people. You have scattered my flock. You have driven them away. You have not visited them. Behold, I will visit upon you the evil of your doings, says the Lord. And I will gather the remnant of my flock out of all the countries where I've driven them. And I'll bring them again to their folds and they shall be fruitful and increase. And I will set up shepherds over them which shall feed them. And they shall fear no more. Neither be dismayed, neither shall they be lacking, says the Lord. And what is the key to him doing this? Look what it says in verse 5. Behold, the days come, says the Lord, that I'll raise unto David a righteous branch. And a king shall reign and prosper and shall execute judgment and justice in the earth. In his days, Judah shall be saved and Israel shall dwell safely. And this is his name. Where he shall be called Adonai said Kenu, the Lord, our righteousness. Friends, this is talking about Yeshua, the Lord. It says a man shall live on the earth. He shall rule and reign. He shall come from the branch of David. And his name is Adonai, Jehovah Tzidkenu, the Lord, our righteousness. So he is our clothing and he is our beauty and he is our dignity. He gives us dignity. Guys, he is look. How do we know he gives us a, a dignity? Because he identifies with the lowly people in society. He, he dwelt among the poor, the hungry, the prostitutes, the tax collectors, the lepers, the sinners, the publicans. He identifies with us in our shame. Number one, and by the way, the story of the Good Samaritan is one of the most powerful stories to represent this. It was the, the, the priests who should have crossed the road, but no, they looked, they had their priestly garments on and they didn't want to get their priestly garments dirty. But it was a Samaritan, an enemy. He came and he took care of the man. And that story of the Good Samaritan, that's a story of the Lord. He is the Good Samaritan. Because the Samaritans and, and the Jews, they were enemies. And we, because of our sins, we are enemies to the Lord. But he's the one who crosses the road. He comes. He finds us beaten, wounded, shamed, fearful, guilty. He binds up our wounds and he pays the price. Number two, he doesn't only identify with us in our shame. He redefined the standards of honor in society. And I mentioned that. He talks about the first being honored. And he says, no, 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 no. It's the last that will be honored. It's not the greatest that will, will be served, but the one who serves will be greatest and it's not the wise and the prudent but it's the little children and look at the sermon on the mount blessed are you when you are mourning when you hunger and thirst after righteousness you know if you break that down it doesn't feel like a very honorable place in life when you're going through a season or a cycle of being persecuted or poor in spirit or mourning or grieving. It feels terrible. And yet the Lord, he's saying, these, in my eyes, you are honorable. The problem is, what are you going to wear, everyone? What clothes are you going to wear? Are you going to wear what the devil tells you? What society tells you? It says you're a loser. You're out of God's will. You must have done something wrong. Are you going to wear those garments, those lies? And this is why it's a challenge to put on the right garments every day. And lastly, everyone, we know that Jesus, Yeshua, identifies with us because he embraced and accepted the shame 
of the cross. Do you know in those days, being naked for a Jew and exposing your genitalia in public, that was a huge shame. Yeshua went on, when he was on the cross, he was shamed. Number two, people crucified in public, part of it was to shame them to make them guilty. He became a guilt offering for us. He was also deemed to be judged and cursed by God. And you know, in that culture, as is today's culture, that is the ultimate shame when it's believed that God himself has cursed you. And yet Yeshua, he became a curse. Galatians 3.13. He became a curse for us, redeeming us from the curse of the law. And of course, for a father to reject his son was also a massive shame in that culture and the lord on the cross my god why hast thou forsaken me he knows he took upon that guilt and that shame for us everyone and so our challenge every day every moment and it is a challenge is number one we get up we face the darkness every morning by going to the light getting that lamp. These are all symbols, everyone. As it says in Colossians 2, these are all symbols or shadows. The reality is Yeshua Christ. Colossians 2, 16 and 17. Everything is a shadow, but the reality is the Messiah. He is the light. He is the oil, the spirit. He is our great high priest. He is our garments of righteousness. He is the beauty. He is the honor. He is the dignity. And he is our great high priest who bears us on his heart, represented in all the 12 stones, representing not one tribe, not a special tribe, but every tribe representing every single person. So just a few questions to end off with everyone. How do we how do we handle because as I mentioned earlier, we our call is to be priests and we grow into that. As we help clothe other people and as other people help clothe us into this, how do we treat prodigals when they come home? This is a challenge. Do we clothe them? Uh, or are we like the older brother who is a moralist? Look what he's done. You've never had a party for me. It's a challenging question. Are we like the father or are we like the older brother? How should we treat a criminal who has just been released from prison? This is a really interesting question, too. He's done his time. He's served his time. That's why he's now been released from prison. Yes, of course, we have to be a little cautious, but we have to treat him with dignity and respect like we would treat everyone else. I know that's debatable. We can talk about that later. But it, it, it is an interesting uh, issue. Because there are some people in the body, the body of Messiah, who we've known that have fallen, but they've repented. And now they're back serving the Lord. And I know some people, and I'm not going to mention names, but they're big, big names. You know them, 100%, you know them. And they're serving the Lord. And I love watching some of their uh, shows. And when I mention them to some other people, they just, they shake their head like that person. And I try to say, but they've repented and they've, you know, they've, they've been dealt with by the Lord. 
And it's like in their eyes, it's like there's no second chances. Is grace, everyone, something given to our worthlessness or to our worthiness? I'll ask that again. Is grace something given to our worthlessness or to our worthiness? Or maybe both. I think it's both. And are we moralists? If so, where should grace come in? Because we need to be moralists to a point, but we also need to know what it means to exercise grace. These are all deep issues that you and I wrestle with, especially with our call to be a kingdom of priests, to be a royal priesthood, a holy nation. As it says in Isaiah chapter 61, verse 6, but you shall be named the priests of the Lord. Men shall call you the ministers of our God. You shall eat the riches of the Gentiles, and in their glory shall you boast yourselves. For your shame you shall receive double. And for confusion, they shall rejoice in your portion. Therefore, in their land, they shall possess the double. Everlasting joy shall be to them. And then in verse 10, it says, I will greatly rejoice in the Lord. My soul shall be joyful in my God, for he has clothed me with garments of salvation. And the Hebrew is Yeshua. He's clothed me with garments of Yeshua. He has covered me with the robe of righteousness. As a bridegroom decks himself with ornaments, and as a bride adorns herself with her jewels, for as the earth brings forth her bud, and as the garden causes things that are sown in it to spring forth, so the Lord will cause righteousness and praise to spring forth before all the nations. Guys, the parasha this week is Titzaveh. This is a command. And I say it to myself, I challenge us all. Let's keep getting the light. Let's keep walking in the light, in our calling, so that we become ministers of light. We come into our calling to be light, to be light to the nations, and to make some impact in this world of darkness. And not only in our lives, but in the lives of those around us. In Yeshua's name, amen. Thank you. Thank you so much, Aharon. And we really appreciate you doing this, knowing how bad you <coughs> felt. That's <laughs> so wonderful of you. you. And um, I loved your question about how we treat people that get out of prison. Um, I just think sometimes we look at how people behave and so many of us i'll include myself i guess have either dysfunction or evil on top of everything but everyone is created in the image of god and just because we can't see it you know because of their behavior it's not smaller in you than it is in me or vice versa it's still there and you know it the challenge is just to accept that i think and treat them as someone created in the image of God. Yes. With honor. Amen. Yes. We don't have to hang out with them or bring right. them into the home, but they still get the honor that we want to have as well. And yes. It can be a challenge. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, speaking of that, Aaron, I'm a chaplain at prison. Um, so being a chaplain, I, I help uh, offenders uh, from right before they get out of prison to 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 uh, to be in the outside world so that's what i do as far as being a chaplain wow wow i'd love to hear at some stage some of the stages or some of the advice you 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 give gary yeah yeah, yeah. Our own this hey Catherine. this study has been a bomb to my heart. Um, 
I'm going to try to say this without crying. So, um, I remember um, my very first memory of abuse was age three or four, mm. uh, being locked in an attic room in total darkness. Um, I was a sexually abused kid at age seven or eight by an older cousin. I was hit with two by fours um, by the nuns at our school. I was attacked by a gang of women when I was 13 or 14 years old. Uh, I was a traumatized kid. Um, and it went into adulthood with an abusive husband, with a sister who assaulted me. And being a child of the 60s and 70s, uh, this was just shoved under the carpet. You never got the help you needed. Uh, the distrust that you talked about, yeah, you learn, you learn. I mean, it's hard to trust people initially for me. Um, what you have said today, I have to go back and re-listen to. Uh, Jesus was abused. You know, yeah. he was abused. And yeah. just, you know, these, these clothes, putting on the clothes and getting rid of these fig leaves which have been there 50 years. Um, yeah, I'm working on that. So oh, I just want to thank you from the bottom of my heart for this study. Thank you. Thank you, Catherine, for sharing that. That is amazing, brave of you to share, and also uh, a testimony of how far you've come and we're all we're all you know we're all working through stuff and a lot of the stuff that i even talked on has come out of my own junk and stuff that i've had to work through as well and a lot of it similar to what you've shared and um yeah and we can see the the beauty and the dignity and the honor and the glory in your life and it just gets brighter and brighter and so we love you and thanks for so much for sharing that amen oh amen. Amen. look in a mirror you got a crown on your head you realize <laughs> well deserved yeah amen so many people you know that have been abused are so hard right they're just so crushed and you know, Catherine, you're just one of the sweetest people I've ever met. So Amen. that's definitely a testimony to what the Lord has done in your life. Thank you. Yes. Thank you so much. Catherine, if I was a Mormon, I'd marry you. <laughs> hey, I heard from a rabbi this week that it's not anti-biblical to have more than one wife, but that they outlawed it because they saw it was not a good thing. <laughs> Can you imagine? But he was serious. It's not in the Bible that you can't have more than one wife. So, jeez, oh, <laughs> I can't even handle one. Yeah, that's. I can't figure that one out. Why anyone would want more than one? <laughs> Dee Dee, I'm not. I'm not going to tell my wife what you just said. <laughs> she, she will worry. <laughs> yeah. Well, there's no. Uh, uh, takers here so yeah right? <laughs> nobody's looking amen, amen. <laughs> <laughs> does say that an elder should be it has to be the uh, husband of one wife mm. right yes and yep. i don't want to be an elder anyway so 
<laughs> but he wouldn't have said an elder, you know, if it wasn't allowable, right? <laughs> he just said, if you're an elder. <laughs> but we're all elders. We're all priests. Yeah, I anoint you all elders today. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> and oh. the wife said, amen. Amen. There's so much about those garments, Aharon. I don't know how you even pared that down. Like each piece, you know, I need to get you to include pictures again in your notes. I know for a while you were having trouble with that. And I was going to experiment and try and put up a picture of the priestly garments, but I didn't want to interrupt your talk. But it really is fascinating. The layers, you know. Yeah, we could maybe work on that. I mean, I, it's no problem including oh, pictures yeah. in my notes. Not no problem at all. I mean, I like I visuals. I, work on I don't know about everybody else, but okay, maybe we could uh, we could work on that. Yeah, yeah, that'd be okay. Great. Especially like if you talk about the temple and you know different things that are right. hard to visualize that aren't current day. Yeah. I've got some great pictures in my study Bible of the priest robes, the temples, all this stuff. And I'm a visual person, so it's cool. I like it. Yeah. Yeah, I, I think I am too. And so maybe I'll uh, I'll look at that more. Okay. Um, that Urim and Thuman, I think that's just a mystery. You know, we were talking about that this week. We were studying it in Torah Club, and, you know, nobody really knows how that worked, right? <laughs> but it's interesting. Like, it's over his heart. And you know how when we go before the Lord and we pray about a situation, you either get that peace or kind of that check. I wonder if that had something to do with how it affected the Urim and the Thuman. I don't know. Um, might I just can, remain a mystery. <laughs> well, um, I, I just know that most scholars suspect that the phrase refers to a set of two objects used by the high priest to answer questions or reveal the will of God. That's 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 what I've heard. Yes. Yeah, it it was um not no, no one knows for sure what they were but it was some kind of way there's a couple of instances in the scriptures uh where it's believed that it functioned for example when all the brothers of david came to samuel and uh <clears throat> and samuel just had no witness that any of those brothers were the chosen one and then when david turned up it's believed that the Urim and the Thummim that were on him it's illuminated and uh but that's speculation as well <clears throat> but it, it would have been if it if it was true it's a good example of how it uh it would have worked but yeah it is a kind of a mystery the the, the word or orim or is from the word or which means light so it, they they lit up they illuminated and Tumin is from the word Tum, which means like innocence. So, yeah, there's some something, something, you know, in, on a on a spiritual level, when we try to discern something, or we we use our 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 um, inner inner spirit, our the witness of our spirit with the Holy Spirit, something illuminates. We get a sense of. I think it says in Romans 8, the spirit bears witness with our spirit. And there's something that illuminates within us. Um, so, yeah. And doesn't God keep some things for himself? <laughs> he does. He sure does. Yeah. So I'm thinking that I find it interesting, and I didn't think of it before is that he's carrying these stones that represent the 12 tribes over his heart. And, and I was just pondering this morning, uh, the, the uh, compassion and uh, recognizing how uh, some of the difficulties the last few years kind of crushed my compassion. And, and I need to really restore that, the importance of it. And so you've got these 
priest, this priest that is representing the people before God. He's got these people that are imperfect and carrying them over his heart kind of holds them close to his heart and, and having a heart of compassion is such a critical factor, I think. And so, um, so as, as we uh, consider how we dress, I think holding the people that we're interacting with in, over our heart in compassion, uh, somehow this morning has taken on a, a new priority for me. Mm. Uh, I, I feel the same, Paul, when I, when I read twice where it says, uh, mentions over his heart, uh, I felt the same challenge as well. But, but also for me, how the Lord um, carries us, not just in his mind, he actually really does carry us close to his heart. And um, that, 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 because I, I remember I did a, I did a, a, a counseling course some time ago. And one thing that the lady taught, but she didn't teach, she just threw out a line. She said, God doesn't really care about us that's what she said and I, I a couple of us challenged her and, and I I'm really not doing it justice because I can't remember the exact context that we were talking about but it was a little it was pretty cold and I know one other lady and, and myself was like what you know and it's kind of stuck with me I wish I'd uh, challenged her a little bit harder um but the point she was trying to make is all the wars and all that. Yeah, of course, the bigger picture, he's concerned, but he, you know, they're not that important to him. And it, um, it, it kind of, it's so to see that, you know, God, he's, he, he's very caring, but it's way out there. Mm. It's not really close to his heart. And so this, I think has reignited something in me that I think I needed to hear. So what do you think the difference is, like why the duplicity, didn't he have the names on the shoulders and then the 12 tribes over the heart? Yeah, what's the question, Dee Dee? Well, what, what, why the duplicity? Why both? Do you, do you know the difference i know they say it's to put them before the lord when he'd go in but yeah that that again that would probably there would probably be a multi answered uh answer to that question depending on how you would uh interpret what the shoulders represent and what the shoulders stand for i i would imagine it would have something to do with you know, if you interpret scripture with scripture, it's something to do with, uh, you know, the shoulder is a, is a, a place of strength, a place of carrying, a place of bearing the burden, something like that. Mm -hmm. um, that's my, my. Aaron, a, a thought. The government hey, shall be on his shoulders. Uh, mm -hmm. The 12 mm -hmm. tribes of the government in the, king, in the kingdom ages. Uh, could that be uh, a line? Absolutely. Great example. And great to hear from you, Don. Long time no see or hear. Uh, I, I just like to sit and watch quietly. <laughs> You're more than welcome. Thanks for sharing. How are you? Nobody and Karen? has good? to, right? <laughs> yeah. How are you guys? Good? We're fine. We're fine. We're waiting for the weather to warm up. It's still cold in Scotland. Mm. <clears throat> right. Not like Minnesota. I mean, cold here is... Uh, you know, above freezing. Right. Minnesota is is what now? What, how cold is it there now? <laughs> Pretty cold. Well, anybody else? If not, Gary, do you have anything? Oh yeah, absolutely. So, excuse me for not showing my face. I'm I've been fluttering a lot, so I don't want to. Uh, I don't want to be a bother to you. I mean, it's okay. You're not on the um, big screen, so. Yeah, Gary, we want to see your face, brother. We 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 see you. As your whenever we see your face, we see 
beauty and, and, and dignity. <laughs> I love you, Aaron. But, but the, it, I want to say something very interesting. If, I'm, if I flutter my language, let me know. I'll, I'll, I'll go back to where I was. But um, You sound perfect. There's nothing yeah. wrong with the sound, so that's okay. Okay, thanks. You want to hear something really interesting, brother? Yeah. Um, you know, you mentioned that uh, before when I wasn't showing my face that it, it, made, it reminded you of God in the book of Esther, Hadassah, uh, for Purim. When, when, you, when you saw every word in, 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 in Esther, but you never saw God. You never saw the word of God, but he was there. He was there the whole time. You know what's really interesting? In this whole parasha, you never see the word Moses, not one time in this whole parish. Right. But yet, yeah. God told Moses, command this, command that, you shall command, you shall command. Every other, it seems like every other paragraph is you shall command. He, who, who was he talking to? He was talking to Moses, but you never saw his name. Interesting, right before Purim, you never saw yeah. Moses' name. Did you ever think about that, Aaron? Yeah, um, a couple of thoughts on that, Gary, is some, some of the ancient rabbis actually believe that when, when Moses got the call from God, Moses came up with a lot of excuses, you know, um, you know, I can't speak. I'm a, I'm a man of st stuttering lips and, uh, and God got angry with him and he said, okay, I'm gonna, I'm gonna get your brother, Aaron. And so some of the ancient sages say this was the this was the call of Aaron and his sons and the priesthood. It should actually have been Moses. But because Moses came up with excuses and complained, not only did Aaron take that role, but this was the beginning of the end of Moses. I'm not saying that he 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 ended his life as a failure but in a way he could have stepped up into that place as the high priest as well but he didn't it was his uh, brother uh, Aaron so you're right it doesn't mention his name but, but the rabbis say this was like the beginning of the end mm. of Moses it doesn't say he ended as a loser cuz he was still functioning uh, doing what God told him to do, but maybe he could have ended up in that place as the high priest. It was just a few thoughts that I read. <laughs> Interesting. And, and everything God creates in his physical world helps us understand his spiritual world. The use of physical gems on the breastplate of the Kohen Gadol is no different. Since these stones represent the 12 tribes and the breastplate is connected with discovering the will of God, the stones represent how precious Israel is to the Lord and his, and his desire to lead them um, into his will. And um, the precious stones embedded in the foundation of the New Jerusalem also represent the 12 tribes. From this, we can understand that the continued importance of Israel in the Messianic age. And also, you mentioned uh, the tribe of Judah. You mentioned that Yeshua is from the tribe of Judah. So, which is interesting. I know you know, I already know this, Aaron, but further signifying Judah's prophetic call as God's holy ones, because Judah's name is Yehuda. And using all four letters of the proper name of God, yud heh vav uh, with the addition of one Hebrew letter, which is the Dalet, and which stands for Dalet is door. So Yeshua died in the land of Judah on the Roman execution stake, rose again and became the door to salvation. And he Amen. said, John 10, 9 says, I am the door. If anyone enters by me, he will be saved. and will go in and out and find pasture. So Yeshua will one day become known by his brethren as, as this door, and they will praise and thank him and know that Yeshua truly is God. And wow. Yeah. Isn't that interesting? That's yeah. That's great. So, wow. Haven't yeah. heard that before. Yeah. Mm. So, uh, Gary, something interesting about the stones, if you go to uh, Ezekiel chapter 28, and it talks about uh, Lucifer being uh, the seal of perfection, full of wisdom and perfect in beauty, you were in Eden, the garden of God, every precious stone was your covering, the sardis, topaz, mm -hmm. diamond, etc. And it lists the same stones. Uh, they belong to Satan. God gave wow. them to him when he was ruling 
Interesting. Wow. Ezekiel 28. Mm, found it. God took it back. And, and, and that's a good point, Don. And we won't go into it now, but maybe in another week. Um, some of the counterfeits um, and the dangers, and that's one of them. And uh, yeah, good reference. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah, Gary. So, so Aaron, why did why did the Jew cross the road? <laughs> why did the Jew cross the road? I don't know why. He was not a good Samaritan. Uh, I haven't heard that. Very good. <laughs> Very good. <laughs> Hey, can I ask a question that's probably super basic? Yes, but, Catherine. Yeah, so the Lord's intention was that all of Israel should be priests. So what is everyone else doing if everyone's a priest? Or is it just that you should have a priestly heart? So the question that you're asking is, if they're not stepping up, if the whole nation is not stepping up, what are they doing instead? Is that what the question? Well, like if everyone's a priest, who does the carpentry? Who does the yeah. everything else? You know, just kind of. Just well, we're all, I, I see what you're saying, Catherine. We're all, before the Lord, we're all priests before the Lord. Because God wants us to act as priests and be holy as he is holy, that's, that's, his, that's his prayer, that all of us will be holy as God is holy. So a priest is supposed to be a holy man of God. So we're all priests before the Lord. It doesn't mean that's our function. It doesn't mean that we can't do different things, but before the Lord, we're all considered priests because we're believers and we're uh, stepping into heaven one day before him, so. Yeah. That's, a good uh, that's good, Gary. And you know what, Catherine? I don't think that that's a simple question at all. I think it's a very, very deep question. And it gets me thinking, just imagine if everyone did step forward and mm. everyone was functioning as a priest. What an incredible society that Israel would live in. They were all... Right. Uh, if they were all functioning on that <coughs> level towards what a community, what a caring, what a loving community it would be. It would be incredible. Right. So, but the so priest, it's like being, being a priest. I mean, that's a big job. If you're a high priest or even a lower priest, how do you have time to like have any other occupation? Then? <laughs> well, there you were know? It's it's just I've always wondered about this. It's a spiritual issue. Keep in mind, Kat, it's spiritual, not physical. Yeah, a lot of things are you know very figurative in the Bible too. But the actual priests, I didn't know this, but there were thousands of them. Mm. They came. They even lived out of Jerusalem, and they would come to Jerusalem to do their priestly duties. And I always figured there were just this set of like 10 right and they're sitting there slaughtering animals all day long i thought how do they do that but no there's I, thousands I, I think also there were certain rosters weren't they i think i think yes. that they had certain times and rosters yeah where they would just go through um uh you know exchanging so mm -hmm. i it 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 may not be that they were 24 7 on duty right uh, maybe different times of the year different seasons of the year different seasons um that they they functioned as that but uh the other the other thought was being a whole nation whole kingdom of priests that it would hopefully extend to other peoples other nations as well just like um you know the ten commandments for example that has extended to most democratic free societies all around the world throughout the last at least three four hundred uh, uh, years and you know a lot of the biblical values based on the ten commands have um have been a good um, good backbone of 
societies that have been very successful societies. So uh, you would think that that was another reason why that call was on the Israelites, so that it would extend to the nations as well. I have a thought. Um, I, I'm a proponent of the seven mountains of cultural influence, that the church should be in the culture to influence the culture. And unfortunately, over the, I'm not going to get into all of it, but we kind of abandoned culture and then complained because culture is um, evil. So when I was working, I was literally a priest in my workplace to minister to people around me and to bring them before God and bring God before them. So the, the, the priesthood that they're talking about here is the, the priesthood that's working in a, a specific field. But I believe that we can be priests in any role or function that we have in society. It can be in the family as a parent. It's going to be in a business. It's going to be uh, wherever we go, we're priests, and we carry God before those people, and we carry those people before God. That's my thought. Mm -hmm. Excellent. 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 Yeah. Paul. Thank you, Paul. Well, Aharon, do you want to close us in prayer? Yes, let's pray, everyone. Father God, thank you once again for your word. We we just are so blessed and challenged, Lord. This is a, a really challenging word. We pray, Lord, as we, I think of that verse that says, uh, draw near to me and I will draw near to you, says the Lord. And uh, that that picture of crushing, pressing in, uh, to get that oil, to get more and more light so that that darkness in us and around us gets expelled. And then we come <clears throat> into that um, fulfillment of our call to be a, a kingdom of priests, to serve our God. Thank you for the garments that you've given us, Lord. Thank you for the garments of righteousness, the garments of beauty and for dignity and for honor, Lord, mm -hmm. and for glory. Thank you, Lord, that you've taken every one of us, like the like the man beaten up on the road to Jericho, and uh, you as the good Samaritan, you've come, you bind up our wounds, you bind up the brokenhearted, and you paid the price, Lord, and you take care of us, and you restore us, and you bring us to good health, Lord, and that we're all in that process more yes, and more. Lord, we are being being transformed from glory to glory and i just thank you so much it's through your word and thank you that we can make we can as i shared we we like your word says today that you that moses commanded the wise those who are wise hearted and filled with the spirit to make the garments lord may you use us mm -hmm. to help others come into their call to be priests to make garments for them for beauty and for honor, to clothe them, to be like the loving father who clothed the prodigal son. Mm -hmm. Give us that heart, the heart that you have for people, Lord, where you identified with the publicans, the sinners, the tax collectors, the prostitutes, Lord, the lepers. You came, you said it's not the healthy that need a doctor, but the sick. I've not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. Lord, may we know more about your grace so that we can take mm -hmm. it to this world who needs your grace so bad in yeshua's name amen gary amen amen i agree with everyone it was a really great teaching Gary. thank you so much and thank you. as humble as i am i know you you're learning more from me and Derek prince every single day <laughs> especially humility amen <laughs> so i don't know how you how you handled it last week as far as the ironic blessing I don't know how you handled the English in Hebrew at all, brother, but I'm hoping your Hebrew got well enough to where you can do the Iranian. I tried to do it like you, but I, I just, I couldn't, I couldn't. <laughs> anyway, if you can all unmute, please. And thank you again. Thank you so much, Aaron. God bless you. You're welcome. Receive the blessing of the Lord. 
shalom. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his hands upon each and every one of you. Fill your own with his peace. Hashem Adonai Yeshua HaMashiach. In the name of our Lord, Jesus the Messiah. Adonai our Lord. Moshe Enu our Redeemer. Pelio Etz, wonderful counselor. El Gibor, mighty God. Mm -hmm. Abiyad, everlasting father. And Sar Shalom, the prince of everlasting peace. And all of God's people says, Amen. 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 Amen.